love the book of Psalms, amen, Psalms 115. Ah, one of the unsigned Psalms. That's good. Sometimes you don't need to know who writes it. That way you can apply it to everybody, amen. Uh, it's a very personal psalm tonight I want to get into. A very interesting psalm. So what I want to do is dissect a little bit. I'm going to take time to read the psalm. And it starts out, not, un, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy true sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Notice the change. Verse 9, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, for he is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Ye are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens of the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither they that go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. I want to point out something in this psalm that I think is the key to the entire psalm. I want to look at verse number uh, 2 real quick. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? I believe that's the key verse. The key verse is the heathen for whatever reason. And I, I want you to look first at the word now. That tells me something has transpired in the life of the psalmist. Something took place. It didn't say that they, uh, let me just uh, read it without it, uh, just simply, where is their God? But he said, where is now their God? So we find the potential here of lost people not understanding uh, the things of God. God he, matter of fact, he talks about the heathen and their gods. They're just like them. Uh, if you love money, you're going to come to naught. He's not talking just simply of a graven image. Uh, Dr. Billy Kanoa used to say that there are images that are metal and there are images that are mental. People today serve different gods. Uh, they, they don't think they do, but they actually bow down to them. Hey, money can't speak to you. huh? Money doesn't have a mouth. Uh, these things don't have mouth. But I find here that the heathen took an opportunity in verse number two, where is now? So we, something evidently transpired. Uh, I thought about how the heathen watch us. Uh, they watch us all the time. Listen, life's hard. Life's difficult. I, I keep telling you that. You say, why did I do that? Because as long as you know life's hard, you make it. Uh, a lot of people, they, you know, you hear all this rosy preaching going out. Uh, somebody going to, you're going to receive a blessing today or whatever, you know. But you got all these preachers. Listen, there's some days I wish I hadn't gotten, gotten out of bed. I think it'd been a little bit better if I just slept in for the rest of the day and didn't get up. Somebody said I got up feeling bad and things got progressively worse uh, during the day. Sometimes you have headaches, sometimes you get sick. Uh, sometimes you get bad news. You go Job chapter number one. Boy, the messengers just kept coming. I mean, one after the other, they came and brought bad news. So bad things happen to good people. And sometimes the heathen 
see these things happening and what we have here is a question that is fielded by an unsaved individual. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Alderman, I, I, I call him doctor. If they wanted to call doctor, I call him doctor. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, but, but at the same time, he dealt with that quite a bit this week that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That's like the Word of God. You can let a lost man pick his Bible up and he'll tell you it makes very little sense to him. I've heard people say, I can't understand the Bible. I read it, I can't understand the Bible. Reason being, they don't have the author on the inside. So what you have is the world looks at things through their eyes and God's children are looking through their eyes. I find in here the sovereignty of God. Uh, boy, the first, that first verse, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. We find that phrase, not unto us, given twice. We find a sincere desire that no glory be brought to the psalmist. I believe that's why it's not named. It's not a psalm of David or of Asaph or one of these. The man who wrote this and, and God inspired this, inspired it in such a way as you don't know who did it. Boy, isn't it blessing when people do jobs and don't tell anybody they did it. Go do something for somebody. I remember a couple of times that me and a couple of more men when people were in the hospital and things and they didn't ask to do it or anything else, we took lawnmowers and we went and mowed and trimmed their yards up for them and cleaned everything up because they didn't have time to do that. Uh, I remember one time John Watts, when he had open heart surgery, uh, went over there with all people with Carl and Bernie. How many remember Carl and Bernie? Oh, let me tell you something. Now, Bernie was on one of these little lawnmowers, uh, and, and he, he didn't know how to let the clutch out easy on that thing. He was popping wheelies going across the yard. So what I was doing, I was push mowing, and him and Carl were on uh, riding mowers, and they were leaving strips of grass all over the place. Uh, the, under, I was doing more time chasing them around. Uh, but, but when uh, Dean got home, you, if he, you know anything about Dean Watts, she takes care of her yard. She rakes up acorns. I mean, she, she makes sure everything's immaculate out there. So we cleaned it all up for them, and they never knew anything. They came home, everything was cleaned. I believe that this is not drawing attention to anybody because it applies to everybody. So we're going to make an application tonight with everybody. So he said, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give mer uh, glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Matter of fact, if you drop on down to verse number 18, he ends with a blessing, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore praise the Lord. So he's talking about all times and in all places in the 18th verse. Now, let's go back to that word now. Evidently, something had happened to somebody that was a Christian in the Old Testament, and that's what they were. They were believers. And somebody just simply said, Hey, if God, if God cares about you, why did that happen? Why did you have a bad day? Hey, it rains on the just and the unjust. We understand that as believers. I do not expect my life to be a rose garden. I don't. I, I I put on my big boy britches every day, and I, you know, I, I just as Dad would say, just suck it up and go to work and get done what you need to get done. You face what uh, you face, and it is what it is because of two things. One, I believe in the sovereignty of God in the life of a child of God. It simply means this: that God can do anything He wants, any way He wants. Now, in troubles, either God sends it or God allows it. God does not send everything comes our way. Listen, suffering is a way of life. Job said, man that is born of woman, it's a few days and full of troubles, he's cut down. Hey, we have hard times and sometimes we, we tell people we're Christians and then they watch things not go our way. Things get tough. 
Our people get sick. Our people die. Sometimes you lose your job. I remember Barbara and I, I hadn't been saved too long, and I came home one night on a Friday night, had a high-paying job. I was a face boss in the mines, and uh, that night they laid off one boss, and it was me. They called me behind the green door. They laid me off that night. They had to lay one off, and I was the only one that would not stay after work and drink with them uh, in the bathhouse. I got out of there, and I went home to my wife. I come home. She always waited up for me. She was asleep on the couch. I woke her up, went in and sat down, and I said, Honey, they laid me off tonight. I lost my job. Boy, it seemed like a real catastrophe. You know, why? You know, you're tithing. You're trying to be faithful to God. You're working. You're doing everything you know how to do. And you come in on a Friday night, and they say you're unemployed. And in our county, 8,000 miners were out of work. So if there's a job to be had, they're lining up. I'm not about the sovereignty of God. God did us one of the greatest favors He's ever done. People look and say, hey, you're tithing, you're trying to live right. Now here you come home and you don't have any employment. One, because I was company, they had to pay me a month in advance. They had to give me all of my vacation time, everything else. They paid my salary uh, they gave me a separation pay, and when I went home, hey, within a week, I was working a better job than I had, a higher paying job than I had, and hey, uh, amazing what God did. But sometimes people don't see it that way. When you're at work, you've got to be careful how you react. One, you've got to be careful how you act, but then how you react. Why? Because God is completely sovereign in your life. I want you to use that. That's a good word. Sovereignty of God. In God's sovereignty, He gave man a choice. That does not interrupt the sovereignty of God. God still does that in our life. So anything that happens to you and I, God has either got to do it, be the author of it, or He has got to allow it. The second thing I believe in is the providence of God. God does nothing or allows nothing to be done for no reason. God's got a reason. If you've got a hard time in your life, God's got something in mind for you in what's called the providence of God. We talk about being providentially hindered. So we find here that word now. Something took place, and look what he said in verse 2. Where is now their God? What is... He just said to the believer, now, where's your God at? God didn't show up. You had a hard time. Boy, that, that question, I, I, the question may be asked, and people do this, if there's a God and He's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, and He is, why does He not intervene to take problems off? Why do God's people get sick? Why do God's people... Uh, lose their jobs. Why do bad things happen to good people? Listen, it rains on the just and the unjust. My neighbor gets just as much rain as I get. Matter of fact, I believe he gets more. Sometimes, you know, if you're looking out, you've got a big storm cloud coming and you look out toward the west and you see a little blue spot up in the sky about that big around. I live underneath that thing. I watch the rain as it comes and it's red. And boy, I tell Barbara, we're going to get a gully washer. And you can watch it when it gets to Princeton, it does this. You ever notice that out your house? I don't know what it is about the lay of the land. But it's dry where we live. I mean, boy, they talk about the storm they got north of us and the storm they got south of us. And I thought I missed a whole nine yards, all right? Now, they said, now, where is your God? The heathen do not see as we see. They see God's children suffer in many cases just like they suffer. The world cannot discern spiritual things. Now what he does, he deals with their God. Hey, we don't want their gods. I don't want a God that can't speak, can't hear, can't feel. I don't, you know, it has always amazed me. I think of Dr. Dan Truax. Dr. Truax was in Africa for many, many, many years over in the interior. 
and they were out knocking on huts, I guess, one day. I, had to, I don't know. It went up to a yard, and a man came out, and he began to tell him about the God of this Bible, and the man just simply told Dr. Truax, I've got my God. He said, where is he? He said, he's in my house, my hut. Oh, Dr. Truax looked at him, and he said, well, let me ask you a question. If your hut catches on fire, do you have to bring your God out, or does your God bring you out? And he said, I have to bring my God out. And Dr. Truax said, well, let me introduce you to my God who will bring you out, all right? And, and then went back to witnessing to him again. So we find that they don't see as we do. They can't discern as we do. Uh, boy, I thought about the problems of life here, but what he does in this psalm is peculiar. I want to look in verse number 3. Verse 2, they said, their God, but in verse 3 he said, but our God. Notice the change in spiritual eyesight. Their God, it wasn't their God, but he gladly claimed in whatever problem he was in, he gladly uh, uh, claimed that God of his. That's what he did in verse number 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. In verse 18, we'll bless the Lord from this time. What's he talking about? He's talking about the now. He said, I'm going to bless God in my nows. Somebody said you bless God on credit. You thank God when you get up in the morning for the day that He's going to give you not knowing what's coming your way during that day. You just say, Lord, you know. And I'm just going to thank God in advance. You know, I thank God before I eat my food. How many do that? Sometimes after you bless it, it's not as good as you thought it should have been. All right. What we used to do with the kids, we knew what they liked and didn't like at the dinner table. So if one of them, I know one of them didn't like green peas, so when it was time, I said, you give the blessing tonight. And he'd look at those peas and I'd make him bless them. You say, why? I ought to be thankful for green peas. You ought to be thankful for whatever you've got on that plate. Dr. Seitner went to a home visiting one night. He told that story many times. An older couple, and he knocked on that door, and they met him at the door and brought him into the house. And they said, we're sitting down to, to supper. Would you like to join us? They had a baked potato that they were going to split between the two of them. And they were willing to divide that baked potato into three portions. And Dr. Uh, Seitler all of a sudden was not hungry. I've never seen Dr. Seitler when he wasn't hungry. The Dr. Seitler wasn't hungry and he said, well, he said, I don't have time to eat supper. But he said, can I bless the food for you? And he prayed over that baked potato. See, that's what he's talking about in that last. He said, we will bless the Lord from this time. And, hey, that's a bad time. That's the nails of your life and forevermore. So he said, as long as we live, we're going to praise God, all right? So this is about praising God. And I thought about that, the spiritual things that the world can't see. When they see us, they don't understand us. They don't understand what makes us tick. What makes us tick is a good old-fashioned case of salvation and the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside. And we're, we're that changed new creature that I deal with often. So I got to thinking about this. And, and when he starts blessing the Lord, notice what he said. He just said, trust. Verse number 9, trust thou. Verse number 10, trust in. Verse number 11, trust in. Verse number 12, hath been mindful of us, and we'll bless Him, and then He'll bless us. So we find that in every case, He's talking about that our spiritual condition inside has to do with our trust of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, all thine heart. Boy, hey, let me tell you something. Sometimes that's hard to do, folks. But we've got to learn to do that. So I thought about this. What He's telling them, He is introducing them here to spiritual blessings that the world cannot discern. You see, the world tonight, they can't discern how much God loves His kids. Know about the unseen blessings of the love of God tonight. I, if I ask you how many thought God loved you tonight, every hand go up, amen. Aren't, hey, aren't you glad 
He loves you tonight. He loves you when you're mad, sad, glad, bad. He loves you all the way around. God just loves you all the time. Hey, there's never been a time. And by the way, God's love is not a changing love. It's, it's not something that diminishes at times and something that's greater at other times. When God gives us His love, and the Bible gives that as an attribute of God, God is love. He doesn't try to love. He is love. God is holy. He doesn't try to be holy. He is holy. So we find the attributes of God tonight. But I thought about the love that He has for the child of God. Over in Ephesians, He said this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. What gives us the fullness of God tonight when we finally learn to comprehend His love? You know, sometimes we ask people, do you love me? They may say yes or they say no. You don't have to ask God. God loves you anyway. Amen. Aren't you glad He loves you when you're mad, sad, glad, or bad? I thank God He loves us all the time. And, and by the way, sometimes I think he, if it were possible, and I don't think it's possible, He would love us even more in the hard times because He has to bestow more work upon us. More grace and no mercy. That's what he said. Thy mercy and thy truth's sake. The truth's sake is he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And the mercy of God, it's always there. They don't understand the blessing of God's love. And then I thought this. The lost do not understand God's unseen blessing of goodness and mercy. Go to the book of Psalms 23, verse number 6. Everybody here can quote that. But he, he says in the last part, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. What's that next word? All. I put that in all caps. All the days of my life. Every day I live, God's mercy is there for me. I'm talking about God. God's goodness is following us tonight. Even in bad times. Listen, God's good all the time. We used to have a saying, somebody come in Bible college, ain't God good. You ever heard them say that? Somebody would holler, he's a whole lot better than that. God's good all the time. God's good when you're down. You need to realize God's good. God's gracious. God is merciful. Listen, every day you live, the, the lost don't see that. They don't see the mercy and goodness of God spiritually in, in our life. I'm not talking about just physical. I'm not talking about just giving you money or giving you this or giving... You know, when we uh, count our many blessings, we normally count the ones you can see, right? I've got a roof up above me and a good place to sleep. I said a while ago I got... Uh, shoes on my table and food on my feet. And that's why I've got food. Hey, aren't you glad? Hey, you got good clothes to wear tonight? Listen, God's good. They don't understand that the goodness of God is not about what you've got. When I preached my mother's funeral, I preached out of the, a passage out of the, I think it's the book of Luke, where it said a man's life doesn't consist of the things that he has. My mom was raised with virtually nothing, but my mother was satisfied with nothing. Always interesting. Boy, uh, Dad left quite a bit of money. Mom just gave it away. Missionary come in, she'd write him a $1,000 check and never even bat her eyes. Always giving and giving and giving and giving. And finally, I uh, thank the Lord she left enough to bury her. But I thank God for that tonight. Hey, the lost don't see the goodness and mercy of God. Then I thought about the lost don't understand the blessing of grace on his children. Oh, uh, Brother Dean Shook, his picture back there on the wall. He wrote that it's been worth every mile. Anybody ever heard that song? Old Dean, old Dean. I remember when he was dying, he sat up in a in the hospital room and Charlene was up there and Barbara and I went up there, several people, and he sat up in the middle of the bed and he was wide-eyed. Almost got bug-eyed. He just wide-eyed. He looked at Charlene and he said, Honey, am I in heaven? <laughs> and she said, No, sweetheart, you're not in heaven. She said, As long as you see me, you're not in heaven. 
But she said, when you see Jesus, you're going to know you're in heaven. And he was just as satisfied with that as he could be, the grace of God. I remember the last time I saw Bob Garrett. I went up to the hospital about two or three days before he passed away. He was in intensive care. And his wife and them, I gave them a break. They went down to get something to eat. I said, I'll sit with him. He's sitting up in bed, and he was eating cold grits and cold coffee. And he was not happy. He told me cold grits and cold coffee. I and he, he hadn't shaved in about a week, and that's not Bob Garrett, all right? Bob Garrett was always clean shaven. He said, the first thing that mortician's going to do, I've left orders, he's going to shave my face. And I, I, I thought about the grace of God. I sat up there, we prayed together, we laughed, we talked. He knew he was dying. He was as good with that as anybody I have ever seen in my life. Bob Garrett was good with that. He'd get to go home. I remember when I left, I turned around at the door and looked back in and I said, Brother, I'll see you later. And he said, Brother Dave, I love you. I'll see you later. I went out that door. Hey, they don't understand the grace of God that is for everything comes your way. God's grace is sufficient. Bible talks about the myriad grace of God. That means it covers everything that comes your way or can even potentially. Sometimes we think the worst. We think about something coming. Doctors are bad about that. They'll always give you worst case scenario. You ever had an anesthesiologist come into the room and you're getting ready to have minor surgery and then he gives you a list about this long of things that you can dive on the operating table. My little sister was a nurse in Ephesus. I remember one time I was talking to her. She said, David, she said, I put 278 people to sleep and 278 woke up. I said, Jeannie, as long as you keep that uh, percentage, you're going to be doing right well. But when you lose one of them, <laughs> all right? She first started putting to sleep in a Jewish hospital in a children's hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, preemies that they were having to do open heart surgery and things on. And she said, I used to tell God, dear God, I'm going to put them to sleep. You wake them up for me, okay? Just, I mean, you know, you can lay their little head there and their little feet down here, 13 inches, 12 inches long, just little bitty fellers. Oh, my. Hey, I'm talking about the great. They don't understand the grace of God tonight. The lost don't understand the, the unseen blessing of His presence with His children. Boy, when we, when we quote out of Matthew on Wednesday night, don't you like that? And lo, I am with you. Not always. No S. I've seen people say, well, that should have had S. No, that's singular. Always is as to a period of time. Always is one time at a time during that period. What he said, well, I'm not just going to be always with you to the end. He said, I'm going to be with you from here and every now that you've got until the end comes. I'll be in your nows. I'll be in your future. I'll be there with They don't understand that. Listen, I thank God tonight I have somebody with me. I carry him around with me. Barbara said I was out on that ride in the lawnmower Thursday. Just, she said my mouth was running like that. It does, doesn't it? Hey, I'm never quiet when I'm on Lumbo. Hey, it's, Lumbo is a good place to pray. One, pray that somebody else come mow your yard for you. All right? But it, it's, it's a good thing. Hey, you can use it. I, I pray on a bicycle. My doctor put me on two things. She told me, she said, Preacher, you're overweight. She said, I want you to get exercise, lose 15 pounds. And I, I told you what she said. She left the room for about two or three minutes, came back, said, make that 12. And I thought of Abraham. And I thought, well, Lord, how about for 10? Well, make it 10. Well, how about for 8? I, I wouldn't have quit at 10 like old Abraham. I would have taken her all the way down and told her, say, hey, let's put on a pound or two, girl. We'll just go out and we'll eat together. I'm talking about the unseen presence of God with His kids. You never are alone. 
Learn to pray in your car. Pray in the time. Pray when you walk and pray when you work. And just thought. That's why he said pray without ceasing. Why? Because we have a presence of God in our life. And then I thought about they don't understand the Holy Ghost. You hear a lot about the Holy Ghost today. Let me tell you something. A lot of people. Uh, they come about as close to blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Some people say you can't do that in our age. What's that? That's attributing the works of the Spirit of God to the devil. That's what he was dealing with over here. He wasn't talking about cursing the Spirit of God. He was talking about attributing his work. I remember a man one time by the name of Jimmy Swaggart that wrote a book, and this is what he entitled it, and you can go look it up, Eternal Security, Doctrine of Devils. Eternal security is the work of the Holy Spirit of God that has sealed us until the day of redemption. Boy, when I, when I saw the title of the book, he said Adam and Eve went to hell. I guess everybody goes to hell except for Jimmy Swagger. I don't, I don't know. He can do anything he wants, I guess, and get away. And I don't mind mentioning his name. You stay away from him. You don't listen to him. You don't turn him on. You don't follow him. You just get away from him as far as you can get away from it. But I, I thought about the blessing of the Spirit of God. Over in John 16, the Lord said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now, here's the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. You know what scared the disciples as much as anything in the world? Was when Jesus said that He was going to die and He was going to go to heaven. That's why John 14, He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You read back in chapter number 13, he let them know he was going to the cross, that he was going to die. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We find in here that the blessing of, of, of oh man, just the blessing of God with us, all right? He, said, he used the word expedient. That word expedient means the best thing that can happen and it needs to happen quickly. Somebody said, make that expedient. All right, what they're doing is they're just simply in a medical term, they're saying stat. We use the word ASAP, as soon as possible that you get these things done. All right, so I thank God for the Spirit of God. The best thing He ever did was go away and send a comforter. Then they don't understand His compassion for His kids. The Bible said, as a father pitieth his children. You know, God has pity on us. God knows we're just God God knows we're just a bag of dirt. You know, I don't think our cost has really gone up. I I read one time where I was worth about two dollars and ninety eight cents at you know at, at street value. <laughs> hey, that's, that's about your dust, your dirt. Your body is made of elements. Your body is made of all of these elements of the dirt and the dust. Boy, what, what a blessing tonight that know that God has compassion. But he said this, who can have compassion on the ignorant? Who's the ignorant? Largest denomination in Christendom is the church of the ignorant brethren. He wrote to them all the time, I'd not have you to be ignorant brethren. He always trying to straighten them out. So one, the, those that are ignorant. And by the way, I like what the old philosopher said, Will Rogers. He said everybody's ignorant just in different areas. Ignorant just means you have not learned something. There's a lot of areas I'm ignorant in, folks. I'm ignorant in some areas, and you're ignorant in the other areas. I, my, my dad always said, just keep your mouth shut because your ignorance began to show at that point in time. <laughs> All right. If you're ignorant, just don't let anybody know it. He said, if you listen to somebody talk and you don't talk, you know what you know and you know what he knows, so you know twice as much as he knows, so you're smarter than he is right now. Compassion. And then the blessing of God's care for his children. The Father pitieth his children. He pitieth them. He knows our frame will be dust. 1 Peter 5, 7, we use that all. Casting, A-L-L. There's that word again. What's all mean? All in the Greek means all, and that's all all means, all right? Every bit. God said you need to learn.
to turn everything, your, uh, your bad times, uh, everything that you've got, give that to God. The hardest thing in the world is sometimes we bring in the altars of our heart, not necessarily to this altar. I want you to use it if you feel like it, but I want to tell you what, you can get right with God in a pew. The two greatest spiritual decisions I ever made were sitting in a pew. I got saved on the back pew of a Baptist church, and I surrendered to God, uh, to the ministry, during a revival meeting on the pew. Didn't come to the altar either time, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm all for coming to an altar. I think it, it gives a commitment to something when you come. But at the same time, I thank God tonight that you can put your cares. You see, they have nobody that really cares for them the way God cares for us. Now I know their family does. Do you know, when we pass people in the streets, my little sister and them just got back again from Oregon. They go out there, uh, got some kin folks living out there. And my little sister said that Portland, Oregon was the armpit of America. That's what she called it. She said, going down the street, you're stepping around arms and legs and stepping over people that are passed out. I'm not talking about every now and then. She said, you walk a hundred yards and you've probably stepped over a hundred people laying on some of those, just laying out there, needles laying everywhere. I'm talking about they're shooting up on the streets. You say, well, they're taken care of. Let me tell you something. Nobody cares. David said, no man careth for my soul. I thank God tonight. The heathen don't know this in our nails when they say, where is their God? Then we look back and say, our God. God cares about our nails. That's what this is all about. They, they were trying to reproach Jehovah God and the psalmist wouldn't let them do it. <laughs> I don't know what his problem was, but it was bad enough they said, now where is thy God? Where now is thy God? Hey, right now, when you need him the most, he's forsaken you. Where is he at? He said, oh, he said, your gods can't hear, they can't see, they can't speak. But he said, I've got one in these verses that I can trust in all the time. I can put my faith in him. You see, you've got two sets of eyes. We've got to be careful. The world watches us. But at the same time, then we have to tell God, or the world, that God watches us. And God takes care of us. Beautiful psalm. And he just said, we will bless the Lord from this time, his now, forth and with all of the nows that we ever have forevermore. He said, we're going to bless God all the way through. And I don't believe the heathen ever did understand him. They didn't understand what he said. Amen. Just stand tonight. You need to come tonight. You come. Where is now their God? We see what they cannot see. We see with eyes that they don't have. We see with spiritual eyes tonight. If you need to come tonight, you come. I don't know where you are tonight, but I want to tell you something. God knows where you are.